Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. This is part one of a two-part series with three epidemiologists who will help answer some of the many lingering questions about COVID-19. I'm joined today by Dr. Ilsa Levin, an AMA trustee and a board-certified internist and epidemiologist, as well as a hospital-based physician for the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Group in Silver Spring, Maryland. Dr. Harris Pastides, an AMA trustee and president emeritus of the University of South Carolina. In Charleston, South Carolina, Dr. Pastides has also worked with national and international organizations, including the World Health Organization and the National Institutes of Health on matters involving higher education and public health. And Dr. Preeti Malani, chief health officer and professor of medicine in the division of infectious diseases at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Dr. Malani is also an associate editor at JAMA. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Uh, as epidemiologists, your job is essentially that of a, quote, disease detective. Has COVID-19 been more difficult to investigate than other diseases? Uh, and if so, why? Dr. Levin, uh, why don't you start? Sure. I think one of the big difficulties has been being able to test patients. Uh, having testing that's rapid and that's easily available has really held us back. One of the other problems has been recognizing the patterns, knowing what you're seeing and not limiting what uh, the presenting symptoms were when you decide whether or not to test a patient. Uh, Dr. Pastides? Yes, and I, and I would certainly add, you know, it's a novel coronavirus, but the mo most important word is novel. And, and so it is, of course, more, more difficult to get a handle on than things we're familiar with. But uh, science is moving forward. We now understand the pathophysiology and the clinical course of the disease better before. We just haven't had enough time to get our hands around it. But I'm very confident in another period of time and in a year from now, we'll, we'll, we'll understand it much, much better. It is just a brand new disease. Dr. Milani, because we are in the process of learning so much, uh, there's still a lot to establish. Do you find that confuses people, that the science uh, you know, doesn't change but develops? I, I do feel it's confusing, particularly to the general public. And the best example is the data around masks. Initially, it was don't wear a mask. Now it's always wear a mask. And there are other examples like that. So the communication piece and keeping keeping everyone up to date is is part of the difficulty. Well, uh, you know, you, we typically use modeling to help track and predict the course of a disease. Uh, let's, so let's talk about that. Dr. Pastides, how has modeling been helpful with COVID-19 and how much can we rely on it? And what has it told us so far? Well, uh, it, it's still a tad early. I think that's, that, that's what the issue right now is. We've got uh, data analytic uh, capabilities like never before. But still, I mean, we're, we're, we're equipped to, to, to run through hundreds of thousands, if not millions of data points. We just don't have enough of them. And so what you like to see is a stability or a conformity through an iterative process. And we're just getting to that point now. But during the early part of the pandemic, the data were very labile. So week by week, we would see major changes in the predictability. So there is no doubt that uh, in a year from now, those big data analytic tools, the convergence, the Bayesian probabilities will allow us to understand uh, COVID-19 much better than we can now. But we're, all, we're rounding the corner. Dr. Levin, so much about modeling, of course, is about the inputs. What are the trickiest inputs or the things where the assumptions have been changing uh, over the course of this pandemic? So knowing the patients who are positive for one thing versus hospitalization and death, when you're looking just at patients who test positive, well, that's less certain. Uh, you're going to have a limited number of patients who are getting tested, first of all, compared to the general population. And then from that, we've, had, we've seen a large problem with patients testing falsely negative. And so that is a less certain entity than if you're looking at deaths and hospitalizations. Well, one of the things I think people are always looking for is some core, some kind of cause. You know, what caused COVID-19? Um, you know, we've heard a little bit about this. Has any information or new information emerged? And how does causation help inform prevention, including treatments and vaccines? Uh, Dr. Pastides? Well, let me start with the wet markets in Wuhan. And, and uh, to me, that's still um, the best guess, I would say. It's a very educated uh, guess right now. And so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm alarmed that at the global level, we still haven't had policies that 
uh, attempt to ban them. Now, I know there are cultural issues. It's easy for an American to say ban them. Not, not so easy if you're used to shopping there and, and, uh, and, and, and profiting from that. But I do believe the, the proximity of bodily fluids, of animals, exotic animals all together, make the jumping of viruses from whether it's a, a, you know, a pig and, and a monkey and, and other things like that to the human much more likely in the future. We've got we've to prevent that. Dr. Malani, how how do what we know? How does what we know inform uh, treatments and prevention? Yeah, so treatments and prevention are are interesting concepts, and I would say one of the big changes clinically is initially we were very focused on the respiratory issues. That this was a a uh, respiratory virus, of course, and we focused on pneumonia and respiratory failure. And as we moved along, we've learned that there's also a larger inflammatory component, and that there are residual issues that continue and we're still learning. And the big one uh, that we're hearing a lot about are cardiac issues, in particular myocarditis in younger people. So the idea of how we treat is changing and we're focusing a little bit more on inflammation. And of course, there's been some good data on dexamethasone, but understanding who benefits and then ultimately getting to a vaccine that's safe and immunogenic. Another area that you look at is how a disease may adapt or change. We've seen this with COVID-19 as it mutated since its uh, initial onset and to what effect. Dr. Levin? Sure. So uh, the original strain that we saw, D614, appears to have been less virulent. The new strain that we saw, that we saw coming through Europe and the U.S. and has now spread, G614, looks to be about 10 times more infectious so that certainly affects the spread of the disease as well. Uh, now, as far as deaths go and uh, overall looking at how people are affected, that doesn't appear to be as different, but the issue is the larger population that's infected. So much more communicable, but the, the jury is out still is what you're saying in terms of death rates? Yeah. Dr. Pastides? Yeah, yeah, mutations have been seen. Uh, I worry, therefore, about vaccine development. So we've got to get a vaccine that covers all of these, uh, if you will, mutants. And so far, I think the news is hopeful in that, uh, as Dr. Levin said, there have been mutations and variability with the transmission of the, of the subtypes. But we want a vaccine that will encompass and, and protect us from all of these. And I think the, the news is hopeful. It, it appears that they're similar enough that they should be covered by a good vaccine. Well, let's talk about what, what can we do at this point when the virus appears to be out of control in so many parts of our country? Um, is a nationwide lockdown the only way to control spread or what are the other options we should be looking at? Dr. Milani, do you wanna start? Sure, yeah, I, I think we have come a long way since March and April where really most of the country was under a stay at home order and we have more testing and we have learned a lot, particularly about mitigation and masks. And so I'm hopeful that we don't need to go back to certainly a national situation where everyone is sheltering in place. Uh, but there may be communities where we need to sort of scale back reopening. And as we're getting into the fall and people are moving around more and the weather's changing, we're gonna have to keep a very close eye on things and actually be open to, to being very nimble and pivoting in terms of mitigation. But to me, it's really the, the physical distancing and the masks that are, are most important. Dr. Levin? I would absolutely agree with that. I think we've seen that masks work. Uh, we've seen that physical distancing works. And we have seen communities able to open up again. But we do have to be pliable, not just as the doctors, the epidemiologists, but also as the population, to the fact that there may be more outbreaks, even if they're in small pockets. And when that happens, pulling back a little bit. I don't think we have to go on a complete lockdown again. Well, that concludes part one of our series. I want to thank Dr. Levin, Dr. Pastides, and Dr. Milani for being here today and sharing their perspectives with us. We hope you'll join us for part two of our update tomorrow. In the meantime, for updated resources on COVID-19, go to ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us and please take care.